Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so maybe one of us can please lead in prayer. Any one of us. Uh, Nikhil, would you like to lead in prayer? Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. We thank you for this day in our lives, Father. We thank you so much for everything, Lord. I pray and we are going to start with the last part. So, I suppose, Lord, for the words of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Father. And give us all this understanding, Father. Thank you for everything. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nikhil. Okay. So we've been talking about uh, a lot about covenants over the last few weeks. Uh, so we've come to the part where we talked about last week, the contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant. And we saw that how the old covenant had certain blessings, uh, but the new covenant has greater blessings. Right? It's much more than what the old covenant had. Right. So right now, you and I as believers must understand that uh, the old covenant is removed. We don't follow the practices of the old covenant, yet there are principles uh, that we apply in our lives. But the new covenant is right now in force because the new covenant is a much more glorious and an everlasting covenant than the old one. Right. So then we also looked at why do we still read the old covenant? Right now, we, we keep saying, okay, uh, the new covenant is better with better promises and better, uh, you know, uh, better uh, blessings and all of this. But why read the Old Testament? So we looked at that, right? God has not changed. And God has, God is still the same. Right? It's the same God. Two, we learn from God's working and dealings. And uh, three, we, we get inspiration from the people in the Old Covenant and how they were able to do so much for God's kingdom. And another very important point we looked at was the old covenant points to Jesus Christ, right? So it's not like the old covenant is, yes, there are a lot of laws and practices and offerings and all of that, but all those point to Jesus Christ, right? So uh, what is the old covenant practices that still remain? We closed with this in Romans 13, Verse 9, he says, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And there is, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right. So basically, Paul is saying, if you want to follow the old covenant, you have one thing to do. That one thing is love yourself as you love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Right? Uh, and when we do that, we'll be you know, following all the commandments of the Old, Old Testament. Right? So we stopped here. Uh, uh, let's look at uh, the next chapter, the New Covenant in Daily. So you and I are part of this New Covenant. Now, being part of this new covenant, what, what, what effect does it have in our lives? Right? Okay, is it like, okay, uh, you know, for example, if somebody is in the army, uh, you know, what's the big deal? You, you never know, right? If they're wearing a colored uniform, colored dress, uh, just casual dress, and they're moving around, you may not know it. Right? You may not know this person is in the army and he's well trained and uh, he he knows how to survive. We may not even know it. But the moment he wears that army dress, the army clothes, the attire, what happens? Our mindset, the way we look at that person changes completely. Oh, this person is in the army. So I'm sure he's gone through rigorous training, gone through uh, you know a uh, lot of challenges in his life. Maybe he has seen a lot of uh, you know, war that has happened. Uh, so the mindset completely changes. Now, what about you and I? As new covenant people, 
everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we say uh, in our daily life must be aligned to God. Like what does what does Jesus say? You are the light of the world, and you are the salt of the earth. The light. When you go into darkness, you will be the light. When you go into uh, places where there is uh, bitterness, anger, jealousy, when you go there as the salt, you will add saltiness. Right? Paul writes, he says, uh, "You are the aroma of Christ." Right now, what is it that we must understand as new covenant believers? What what is it? First thing, we are His own special people. Right? No matter what language, no matter what race, doesn't matter what uh, how much how intellectual, it doesn't matter of our wisdom or our understanding. All of these things don't matter. The moment we believe in Jesus, we accept Him as our Lord and Savior. Here's the thing: we are His own special people. Remember, we looked at it a few classes before. God draws a contrast between His people and those who are not His people. Now, that contrast doesn't mean that God is separating them. No, it only means that there is a certain kind of blessing for those who are in His kingdom. But the gates are always open. Anybody can uh, believe and enter uh, and believe in God. God, as uh, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this verse, Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Right? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Which means what? Redeem is to bring us out of every lawless deed things that that were, that have taken us away from the course of living a holy and a righteous life he can redeem us from that and purify us for himself to do to be what his own special people <clears throat> isn't that wonderful right uh, you know if you look at you know the, we all have these special days right you have your birthday. Now, when, when it's somebody's birthday, they feel special on that day. right? Maybe their friends and family and their loved ones uh, give them gifts and celebrate their birthday, cut cake and call friends. They feel special. right? Or if somebody has you know, done well in their school, right? they've done well, they've got the first rank in their class. What happens? The, the teacher makes them feel, okay, this boy or this girl has got the first rank in the class. Let's appreciate him or her. Right? What are we doing? We're making them feel special. And it's a nice feeling. None of us can say, no, I don't want to feel special. Right? Uh, we like to feel special. Right? Uh, we like it when people appreciate us, uh, when people you know encourage us. They, they're, they're, uh, we like it when people are, you know, blessed by you know the things that we do or say. It's a nice, it's a special feeling. Now God is saying, "You and I are His special people." Right. So in God's eyes, we are special. So every victory that we uh, that we win, God is celebrating that. You know, there were time. There are times we may fail. Right? Remember that because we are God's special people, He's always there with us. Right? Uh, when, when we when we succeed, when we do things, and and we are successful in our workplace or in the ministries, God is celebrating with us. Even though it is God who gives us the grace, God is celebrating us because we are His special children. Now, this is something that should not stop us from doing what is best for God. And because we are glorifying Him. And He says, You are His special people. Look at 1 Peter 2 9. Uh, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people. Now, these four things, we may not even feel it in our life. Maybe we are praying and we're feeling, uh, you know, we're praying and say, God, you know, I'm going through the season. And we may not even feel like a chosen generation. We may not even feel royal. We may not even feel as a holy person or a special person in God's eyes. But here's the spiritual truth. It's not based about our feeling. Our feelings change. One day we're happy, sad. But God's, the way God looks at us, is the same. So it's not about how we feel. Some days we want to get up, we want to pray. Some days we feel we get a headache. Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to read. It's all right. But it doesn't change. God is not saying, okay, now you are not my special people. No. We are still the same. Right? We are kings and priests uh, in, as God's covenant people. Then we, we are living differently. In Ephesians 4, Paul talks about that wonderful chapter and how we are uh, in the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, God has called us to live separated. Right? You know, the word church, ecclesia, which means called out. He's saying we are living, we are different. We don't live like the world, but we are called to impact the world. The church is called to impact the world. So we live differently. So Ephesians talks also about the uh, fivefold ministry and how, uh, you know, through the fivefold ministry, we can live differently. We live with a new covenant culture, right? Meaning what? Our culture, our thinking changes. It's no longer, okay, only. Uh, only the Jews or only, uh, you know, only they can enter into God's presence. No, it is everyone. A culture in the new covenant where all of us are equal in the eyes of God. We all stand on level ground. We walk in new covenant community, walking in love. Right now, uh, we talked about this in, uh, when you look at Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church and he's saying, you all have all kinds of gifts. You're flowing in the gifts of prophecy, the gifts of the Spirit, wonderful. But as new covenant believers walk in love. And he ends that entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he says, Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. He doesn't say the greatest of these is prophecy, or the greatest of these is working of miracles, or the gift of faith. He says the greatest of these is love. So as New Covenant people, we are called to walk in love. This is our foundation. Another aspect here is walking in the provisions and blessings of the New Covenant. Right? Uh, Abraham's blessings included. We are uh, the daughters, son and daughters of Abraham. We go beyond the promises of the Old Covenant. And we talked about that, right? Uh, more than what the Old Covenant is do, giving us. The new covenant has greater promises. And finally, by faith. Jesus taught us about faith. He taught us uh, about how to walk in faith. Right? Uh, remember, he tells the disciples, you know, you go into the boat. You'll go on. I'll meet you on the other side. And Jesus walked on water. And he tells Peter, Peter says, Jesus, if that's really you, call me also into the water. I want to come into the water. Jesus says, come. Right? And Peter came into the water. He was teaching them about faith. Now, Peter knows he, he is a fisherman for many years. He knows the seas in those areas, in those localities, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he knows those are not just rivers, you know, those small rivers and ponds. Those are seas. When, and seas can roar up a storm at any time. So Peter knows, probably in his entire life, he's never thought of this. He knows that if you jump into water, you'll go deep down, if you don't know how to swim. 
but he walked on water. Jesus allowed Peter to, to express his faith. And he did that so many times. He tells the disciples, how many people are there? Uh, maybe about 5,000 people. Okay, go, what do we have to eat now? Five loaves and two fish. Okay, take that five loaves and two fish and bring it to me. He prays, he gives it to the disciples and he says, go and give it to everyone. Now we'll look at the faith of the disciples. And he says, uh, but there's only five loaves and two fish. I can eat that alone. But the disciples don't say that. Maybe they thought it, but they never said it. But even as they began to express faith, God worked on their behalf. Right? And so the, by faith, we can walk in the steps uh, like how Abraham walked. And that amazing faith, uh, that great faith. Right. So we end with this on section one, which is the covenants. Right. Uh, what I like to encourage you is continue to, you know, whenever you have time, read it. Go through the covenants, the covenants that God established in the Old Testament, and really begin to dwell into that. Right, uh, uh, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Messiah covenant, and and you can also learn about the uh, sacrifices and the feasts, and uh, it really, you know, just expand your understanding on how all of this pointed to Jesus Christ and gives us a better understanding of the scriptures as well. Right. So any questions before we go into the next section, section two? Any questions? Everyone OK, able to follow through? All right. OK, let's get into section two. Now, the first section was the covenants. The second section is we're going to be talking about the cross. Right now, we did talk a little bit about it in uh, last semester when we talked about lifestyle evangelism. But now we're going to talk about the power of the cross. Right now, without the completed work of the cross, without the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Christian faith would just be another religion. Yes, and oh, it's just another religion man came he said something and he died he did some good works he did a few miracles he died so that's the end of the story it's just going to be a, another religion but the death the burial the resurrection that he's alive right now proves that the lord jesus has defeated the works of the devil he has broken every bondage. He was. He has broken every, uh, uh, you know, yoke, every evil that the enemy has brought into this world. Adam and Eve, through them, sin came into the world. The first Adam, through the second Adam, the, you know, came life and life in abundance. Right? First Adam brought death. The second Adam brought life. So. The cross of Jesus Christ is a powerful, powerful place. It's a powerful encounter because it changes everything. It changes history. It changes humankind. It changes the way people can think of things. Imagine the entire world right, is talking about this person named Jesus who died 2,000 odd years ago in a small city in Jerusalem. Now we are talking about him. And in India or in different nations, the entire globe is talking about this event. If it was not, if it was not God, we wouldn't be talking about it. Right? This is something that we see, we know that it is the power of God. It is God's work. And 1 Corinthians 1.18, we look at it many times last semester. We just read that. But the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. This must always be the background and a foundation in our life. Right, we whatever we do, 
the message of the cross. The cross is our foundation. Right? So let's get into the chapter study, the centrality of the cross. Right? Let's read this portion. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 to 25. Can one of us please read this? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. It's on your notes. Yes, anyone can read this, please. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish, uh, foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness is stronger than men. Right. Thank you so much, Vimal. So, Paul is writing to the Corinthians now. Right now, just a little bit of background about Paul. I'm sure we all know about him and all his achievements. One of the most prominent, most influential leaders in the early New Testament church. Born in Tarsus, which is modern day Turkey. Uh, the, uh, the apostle, uh, you know, Paul was schooled and trained under the best teachers, Gamaliel, uh, uh, Pharisee of the Pharisee, commander of the temple guard. Uh, uh, just this great understanding of the scriptures, uh, Hebrew or, or Hebrews. Uh, he had so much of credentials, but after he had the encounter on the road to Damascus with the resurrected Lord Jesus, his life changed completely. Right? He spent several years in the desert. And he goes on to say in the book of Galatians, in the letter to the Galatians, he writes briefly about his own testimony. right? Uh, uh, and he says, what I receive from the Lord, I give to you. That is what his revelations. right? In uh, Galatians 1, 11 and 12, he says, uh, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to be by me is not according to a man. For neither received it from a man, nor was I taught it. But it came to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at that. What a powerful testimony. The Apostle Paul is saying, hey, nobody, after my encounter, nobody taught me about who Jesus is, what he did not. Nobody taught me. There was no disciple, Peter, James, John, nobody was there. What I received from the Lord, the revelation that I received, even in the, to the Corinthians, while we normally say this during the Lord's Supper, he says, what I received from the Lord, I give unto you. The night the Lord Jesus was betrayed. Was he there the night Lord Jesus was betrayed? He was not there. But he received all of it through, uh, you know, uh, all of these things he received from the Lord, directly God, the Lord Jesus speaking to him. Almost half of the New Testament is written by the great Apostle Paul. 27, uh, 13 out of the 27 books are written by him, even if you're given uh, the book of Hebrews. And in about 20 years of preaching, he planted his four missionary journeys. He planted so many churches uh, in Asia Minor and Europe, raised up so many leaders all the way from Jerusalem to Rome. Everything, everything. He did, uh, you know, uh, there's a writer which says that Apostle Paul, he alone did what all the 12 disciples together did. He alone did it. Such a powerful 
ministry that he had. But why was this ministry so powerful? What made Paul such a, you know, you know so powerful? And uh, you see that for 20 years, his consistency was this, was, you know, do the ministry of the Lord. What was it? What was the focus? Here he says, in 1 Corinthians 1, in through 17 to 25, he says, uh, let's look at that uh, verse 22, right? For Jews request a sign, Greeks uh, seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks, it's foolishness. So, Apostle Paul had many, many, many things to speak about. One, he could talk about his personal testimony. You know, once I was like this, because he briefly writes to the believers, but he doesn't talk about it. Right? He doesn't two, he doesn't say, Oh, these are the number of churches I've planted. And three, he didn't talk about those great revelations he must have received from the Lord Jesus himself. He doesn't talk about uh, you know how Jesus came and probably sat next to him and told him. Uh, about this whole this understanding of what he did on the cross. Let's talk about all that. What does he say? We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block because it, it's not good. It, it's you know, Jew, for the Jews, Messiah being crucified, big no. But to the Greeks, it's foolishness. Right? So Paul the Apostle made it very clear in his ministry that he will not preach or teach anything else except the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross was his focus, right? The central theme. Now, as a body of Christ globally, it's very important for us to focus our attention on the cross. Our preaching, our teaching should be. Uh, aligned to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we see here that there was sustainability in Paul's ministry because, of course, there was also a lot of persecution. You know, the truth hurts. When we preach the truth, people will attack. And that's what happened here. Paul was able to sustain and continually do these plant churches uh, start ministries and start raise up leaders and travel to places. Why? Because he had one focus to preach the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And no other focus. Paul didn't write those letters saying, oh, one day these letters, you know, a thousand years later, these letters will be great letters and my name will be written in heaven. All those things didn't matter. You know, when you look at what's happening in the global church right now. It's wonderful to hear about the revival that's has, happening in Asbury and uh, which is moving into different colleges. It's wonderful. Praise God for that. But what we also see is the church is getting diluted. There was this one time I was listening to a sermon. I just thought, okay, the topic, just a random sermon on YouTube. I leave the preacher unnamed. But I clicked on the message, it was about a 40 minute message. So I was listening to the message. The first 15 minutes, he talked about this preacher, a very well known preacher, global, got a mega church, and all of that. First 15 minutes, he was talking about how he and his wife planned their vacation. The next 10 minutes, he talked about how uh, their dressing sense, you know, uh, what are the clothes they buy, where they go shopping. So I wasted 25 minutes listening, the first 25 minutes, and I, I, I was waiting for the message to start. Right? The message is not even 25 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, and then another 10 minutes on you know, dressing sense and all of these things. And then he talk, talks, so that's 25 minutes is gone. Then he begins to talk about what you know Moses did, what Joshua did. He, never, he probably it was at the 40th minute that he brought one verse. 
and he ended with one more story and he closed. 45 minutes, thousands of people sitting in the congregation and listening to this, full of jokes, you know, and now there are times that we hear positive messages. People want to hear positive messages. It's good. But the cross of Jesus Christ is not positive. It is a, it's a life-changing message. It's not a positive message. Positive messages, it will be there and it will go away. When the difficult times comes, that positiveness will run away. But when we have a life-changing message, the word of God is able to you know, penetrate our spirit and it stays with us even through doing those difficult times. Feel good messages, positive messages. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there are there are some places where uh, the congregation is given handouts. So they write, "What would you like?" The question would be, "What would you like to hear us preach this coming month at church?" And so they, the congregation is given the options to write. These are things that are happening in the church. But what is Paul saying? Hey, whether you like it or not, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, whether I'm in Corinth, whether I'm in Jerusalem, I will preach the cross of Jesus Christ. My message will not change. Uh, imagine the Romans saying, why don't you just change your message? You're a Roman citizen. You don't have to die. You don't have to give, do this. I'm sure the Romans would have thought that, right? Hey, you're a Roman citizen. You're so brilliant in your mind. Why do you want to teach about all these things? Talk about something else. Talk about life. Talk about how you can, you know, do some uh, tent making business. No, he doesn't. He doesn't compromise. He says, no, I'm going to teach the word. I'm going to preach the word. To the point that he goes into Caesar's palace and even there he preaches. You see the last portion, if you read the last portion of the book of Romans, he says, greet those who are in Caesar's household. Whenever I read that, I get shivers down my spine. The Apostle Paul has reached out to people in Caesar's household through the message of Jesus Christ. So, you and I, each one of us, you know, we will get opportunities. We may start our own ministries. God may call us to preach and teach in different places right but remember the focus is the cross you can add you know small testimonies you can add in your preaching you can add uh, you know uh, examples illustrations all of that is good right? you learn that in homiletics uh, illustrations examples parables you can add them but what is the center, centrality of that message? It should lead to the cross. It should lead to the victory that Jesus won for us. Right? So remember that whatever ministry, right, whatever ministry we are doing, always be focused on that. Right? Next point, not with wisdom of words. 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Water baptism, is it important? Very important. But Paul is saying here, God did not send me to baptize. You see the focus there. He's saying, God, water baptism is good. You know, Paul himself writes a whole portion in one of his letters in the book of Romans. He says, when we are water baptized, we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we go into the water, we are uh, you know, signifying his death. When we come out of the water, we are signifying his resurrection. And when we come out, we are new, we are new creation. Uh, we are, you know, uh, uh, we are one in him. It's a physical, it's a physical proclamation, a public pro proclamation of our belief in the Lord Jesus. He talks about it. But here he's saying, water baptism, God did not send me to baptize. If people come for baptism, good, I'll do it. As he baptized, he later on says, I baptize a few people. But he says, God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Um, the preaching of the gospel 
Now, I want each one of us to understand this, right? It's very important. The preaching of the gospel does not require great oratory skills, great eloquence, great intellectual reasoning, great brilliance of human wisdom. It does not require any of that. But all of this is important, right? Uh, the, the Apostle Peter and even Paul says, be ready to give a defense for the gospel. Paul the Apostle gave a defense for the gospel. Was he eloquent? Yes. Was he intellectual? Yes. Was he brilliant? Yes. But what is Paul saying here? You don't, you and I don't need to have all these uh, attributes and only then I will preach. No. We can be a believer for one week. Nobody can stop us from preaching the gospel. Nobody. Nobody can say, no pastor, no prophet, nobody can say, uh, hey, you're only one week in the Lord, don't preach about the cross. Nobody can say that. Because when we preach, we're not preaching with human wisdom. We may not know the, the greater truths or greater revelations of God's word. But if we have accepted the Lord Jesus and we've experienced his forgiveness in our life, you and I can, you know, preach the gospel. But here's the uh, here's another important aspect. Just because we can preach the gospel doesn't mean that we don't improve ourselves. Right? Uh, some of the things that I personally do is I I listen to a lot of TED talks. I'm sure you've heard of it, right? Now the reason I listen to it and I listen to uh, these uh, how to over how to speak fluently, how to uh, improve your communication. All these are things uh, you know that I listen to, uh, practical things. Why? It's because I know that you know God has called me for preaching, uh, and I'll have to go on the stage. I'll have to preach. You know, uh, hand motions, or uh, the way we stand, the way we, uh, you know, uh, uh, eye contact. All of this is important, and these are things that we learn over time. Right? But that does not take priority to the cross and because it's only through the cross that that you can see lives transform we can see people change only through the cross our testimonies right for example we are sharing our testimony now we're sharing it's a powerful testimony we're sharing you know one day i was like this i was like this uh, and even our testimony can stir up people. But if our testimony is not pointed to the grace and the love of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that we can find on the cross, that testimony will just be a self-exhortation. It, it won't be a testimony for Jesus Christ. And what will happen? People will forget that testimony and there will be no impact. Right? So, we, the Lord has given us right now in the day and age we're living in, there's a lot of tools, right? Methods and props and, uh, you know, two minute videos and so many things that we can do. While we do all this, it's good to do it, right? But let us not turn our attention towards anything else, not even to ourselves, not even to our testimony. It's not about us, it's about the cross. Right. Next one. The message of the cross is the power of God. Uh, now, we've talked about this in uh, lifestyle evangelism as well. You know, it may sound foolish to people. It may really sound foolish. Uh, this man in Jerusalem came, he lived, he did a couple of miracles, he died. He died a gruesome death on the cross. And now, people are preaching about him. It makes no sense. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But it's the power of God unto salvation. The power to save, the power to heal, the power to deliver, the power to break bondages, the power to bring healing, to, you know, the power to 
or destroy the works of the devil. All of this is available for you and me, you and I, because we believe in the message of the cross. Right? Look at the scriptures, oh, such powerful scriptures. Right? And you and I have these tools. First Corinthians, I think it's First Corinthians 15, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's saying, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are mighty in God. They are mighty in God. So our weapons that we have, they are not carnal weapons. They are not weapons that people, you know, that we uh, have, you know, which, which die away and fade away. No, they are mighty in God. Right? They bring down strongholds, break down pretensions and arguments. Every reasoning is brought down. Right, so you and I are to use these weapons again in Ephesians 6 in the last chapter. He's writing and he's saying, He's writing to the church, right? addressing the entire church. He's saying, Church, you put on the armor of God, put on that helmet of salvation, put on the breastplate of righteousness, the sword that is double edged sword that is, uh, uh, that is the word of God, the belt of truth. The shoes with the readiness to preach the gospel, right? The shield of faith that will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. We have to put it on. Now, when we have so much, all we have to do is believe it and use it, right? The cross is surpassing all the wisdom of the world. Even though it is foolishness to people, it's surpassing all wisdom of this world. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, I read 19 and 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now, is the world full of wisdom? Yes. There are a lot of, you know, contemporary things that are happening in terms of medicine, in terms of media, technology, in every area, we see that there is wisdom, right? Now, you know, with, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of chat GPT, uh, where it is so, so wonderful, right? Uh, AI responses, uh, where you can just type in uh, whatever you'd like. So if you, for example, you want to, type in you know, about cycles or you want to type in anything and it will give you a response like as if somebody is talking to you that's chat jbt right so you look at all the wisdom that things are happening around us right? there's a lot of wisdom but god is saying i will make all this wisdom of the world foolish right you look at the scientists, they are, they are doing researches and now they've come up, you know, they wanted to find out how many galaxies are there. That, that was never going to happen. They cannot find it. The universe is so vast. Now, look at the human body. There are so many questions that scientists have no idea what, what's happening. They're not able to well, of course, they crack the DNA, but there's so much that is unanswered. The wisdom of the world can be made foolish. You know, uh, the best example is, remember the, the Titanic? This, they built that big ship saying, even if God wants, this ship will not sink. What did God do? The wisdom of the world was made foolish. And so many, so many. Look at the earthquakes that are happening right now in Turkey. And, 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 and it's very sad. But what we see here is, you know, man think that they are humans. As human beings, we think that we've reached a level of wisdom that nobody can reach. But God is saying, I will make it all foolish. I'll break it down. Look at those twins, twin towers in the US, United States. And they were 
you know, they were so proud of it all. With the wisdom of man, we built these two towers. What happened? It's brought down. Because we're not saying God did it. But the wisdom of the world was brought, brought to nothing. And God, you know, religion has a way of making our approach to God very complex. Oh, you have to do this, you have to do this. You know, every time uh, I ride, after I drop my son from school and I come, my heart breaks because I see these small shrines, you know, Christian shrines, and also, you know, the uh, shrines of other faiths. And I see people there standing and holding hands and crying. And, you know, maybe they're going through so much of challenges in their life. My heart breaks. The only verse that comes to my mind is in the book of John when and Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and he says, the time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Sometimes I feel I just go to them and tell them, hey, you don't need this place. It's not about the place. It's not about the shrine just standing here. It's not about this. It's about him knowing him in spirit and in truth. Right? Religion makes things so complicated. But religious people often stumble to something that is simple. But the simplicity of the cross is you just come to him. Humility in our failures. We don't need candles. We don't need any works just by faith. That the wisdom, this wisdom will make the world look foolish. It pleases God when the cross is preached. First Corinthians 1 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. People may ridicule you, people may make fun of you, people may uh, you know persecute, but we must not stop sharing the message of Jesus Christ. Why? Because when we are doing it, we are pleasing God. Can you, can you imagine that? We are pleasing God. God is pleased. So every time you and I are preaching the gospel, preaching the message of Jesus Christ, God in heaven is looking down on us and he is pleased with us. Now you may be preaching to 10 people or 10,000 people. It doesn't matter. For God, you're preaching the message of the cross. God is pleased with that. He's pleased. He's happy. He said, this is my son. This is my daughter. What he's preaching is what, is what I did for them on the cross. What he's preaching, he or, he or she is believing it. Right? Powerful. The audience can't change the message. Quickly, we'll just look at it and we'll take a break. First Corinthians 1, 22 and 23. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. To the Jews, they are very spiritual people. So for them, a person who died on the cross uh, is, is not somebody who will they will believe. Even now they're waiting for the Messiah. It's a stumbling block. Right? From this message, it is clear that Paul considered that the message of the cross is the central. Whether you're, uh, you know, the, the audience can be anybody. Right? You may be going to prison ministry. Now, when you go into prison ministry also, the, whole, the message should be the cross of Jesus Christ. Right? It shouldn't be anything else. Whether we're going to uh, the richest person in the world or the or the meekest in slum ministries, or for the poor and the destitute, the message remains the same. The audience does not change the message. Right? So, this is something that you and I can really believe in and work in. Let's take a break. We'll come back and continue from where we stopped. Right? Thank you. Let's take a break. We'll come back at 10 o'clock.